Hello, this is the Mushroom Wizard, and I'm returning again with another presentation regarding the mushrooms of Saskatchewan and the ways in which we go about uh, picking and identifying those mushrooms for various purposes. So the last uh, couple of presentations have been more special interest areas of uh, mushroom picking, and this one will as well fall into that category. Uh, this one concerns uh, mushrooms that are used either to create dyes for dyeing various fabrics or um, our one-off kind of canvas mushroom here that we'll be talking about right away. Uh, so this is fine art fungi of Saskatchewan. Uh, the genre that we will be dealing with will be Ganoderma, Vomitopsis, Hydnellum, Inonotus, Violus, and Cortinarius. And there will also be a couple species repeated. It's just worth repeating because they're uh, uh, of particular importance to this area of mushroom picking. So what is in this presentation? Uh, this presentation includes mushrooms used for the creation of natural dyes and mushrooms used in a creative manner. And uh, there are certainly a lot more mushrooms that could be included in this area, uh, but we've already covered a lot of them and um, I really don't want this presentation to go beyond the half hour mark if at all possible. So. We've got a lot to cover as it is. So the first species we're going to look at is the artist's conch Ganoderma aplanatum. I believe this is the only Ganoderma species um, that occurs here. The very utmost famous uh, species in this genus would be uh, the reishi mushroom, which is uh, uh, used in medicinal practices or or uh, traditional healing practices uh, in many parts of the world, including Asia. I believe, however, this is the only Ganoderma species in Saskatchewan. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this one also uh, is thought to have some uh, healing potential, some uh, natural healing benefits. However, uh, I'm including it in this section because it's much more interesting as the artist's conch than as a type of reishi. So the conch uh, has concentric bands of dull brown to tan. You can see that there. Uh, it's quite a, quite a handsome looking mushroom. It is fanned oval shaped, sometimes eccentric, and it is rough on the top. This is the top part, top part that we're looking at. Uh, it has an off-white margin. You can see that kind of curled upwards, um, almost like the bottom is, is curling upwards there. Uh, it has a sessile attachment to the, to, to the wood. So if you recall, sessile means uh, it has really no stipe, so to speak. It just kind of has this kind of base area where it's a little bit thinner. And uh, then it grows up to about 12 inches in diameter or larger. This is quite a large mushroom. And there you get to see the top again, just from a couple of perspectives here. Looks like a bit of an older one on the left. Uh, no longer has that off-white margin. And then some younger ones on the right, just in various stages of development. The pores are white to gray in color. Uh, they bruise brown and you don't really need to put much into it to bruise them, just uh, a bit of pressure. And the amount of pressure that you apply to it, uh, the darker that brown will get. And that's very important into the artistic use of this mushroom as we'll see in some upcoming photos. And then this produces a brown spore print. There you go, there's some more photos of the underside. It is strikingly white. In terms of its ecology, this mushroom is parasitic to saprobic. So generally speaking, you would find this on trees that are kind of slated for death. 
they're kind of on their way out and then uh, they would continue feeding off that tree uh, for uh, perhaps years even and then um, eventually the tree dies and the mushroom just continues growing there it is perennial so it just gets bigger over the years uh, and uh, it is uh, fairly solitary to scattered. We've seen some scattered ones, but it's a very large shelf uh, bracket polypore. It's really hard to be super gregarious when you're that big. So the use, um, this white uh, porous surface, like the underside, uh, uh, permanently bruises in kind of just these sepia tones. And then different pressure creates different shades of brown. Uh, the pore surface can also be used as a paint canvas and you've got a an example right there where This mushroom has been mounted and it's been painted on and in the background you can see that uh, Bruising has has been applied as well to create a different shade of brown It's quite a pretty piece Here's some more uh, some more examples for you and you can really see that various shades of that sepia brown dependent upon um, how much pressure you've applied and then of course uh, that would just basically last indefinitely you could put like uh, some sort of varnish on it and uh, it's a very woody polypore so I, again it's not going to rot or anything um, it's a very interesting canvas for you the one on the right I picked specifically because it has a salamander. Looks like some, some type of spotted newt. Uh, I love salamanders. I've often kept them as pets. Um, I have an oxalotl right now. If you know what that is, you're cool. If not, well, it's cool. Trust me. Here are some more examples. These are ones using paint. Likely somebody drew on, him, on them beforehand. Uh, just using the... Uh, the surface and uh, maybe a pencil um, and then painted it. The next one we're going to talk about and and pretty much for for canvas type uh, mushrooms that's the, that's all there is here that we've got. The rest of these are actually going to be uh, species that are used to create dyes and they're uh, mixed with other chemicals or or um, other things so as to create various colors. Uh, the first one is called um, the dyer's polypore, and that's Phyllus schwenitzi. The conch is variable in color. It's brown, yellow, cinnamon, violet, tan, olive, uh, anything in between. And then multiple colors and shades are kind of arranged in these concentric bands. Those colors are all kind of muted, I find. Uh, and then these turn kind of a brownish with age overall. And they're probably looking at a, a fairly aged one there. Uh, the lobes are fan shaped, the funnel shaped, and sometimes eccentric. We're kind of seeing all three of those in that picture there. Uh, multiple lobes attached together via a central branch that kind of goes downwards. And then, of course, these take on kind of like a shelf life appearance, uh, a, a shelf like appearance. That's kind of what we're seeing there. It almost looks like various layers or plateaus placed upon one another. Uh, they have a velvety surface that can become smooth with age, especially if there's rain or other such conditions that are kind of rubbing that uh, velvety surface off. Uh, the margin is lobed and tends to be lighter in color or else the bands will get lighter towards the margin. Uh, it does bruise brown and these grow uh, fairly large again up to about 12 inches. This is a, a polypore that grows on the ground as well. I should mention that. Um, there are a few of them though they're not too terribly common. There you can see a, a different coloration there. It's actually quite a nice uh, looking mushroom when it's in its uh, violet sort of when it's a, a violet color and here's a size reference for you the pores are yellowish orange becoming olive brown with age they are decurrent they run down that kind of 
dipe like branch. Uh, the pores are thin and angular. Again, they bruise a dark brown. You can see somebody's pushed into it in some spots there, and you can see that bruising. And this produces pale yellow spores. And you can see a close up of the uh, pores there. These are, again, parasitic to saprobic. Uh, they attach primarily to the roots of conifers and appear terrestrial, as I just mentioned there. It looks like it's growing from the ground. Well, it is, uh, but it's, it's actually attaching to buried roots of a tree that are either um, probably not doing so well or is, is dead. And uh, you'll also find them at the base of conifers. Uh, these are solitary to scattered, and they are found spring through fall, so the whole year round. Uh, so you can derive various dyes from the mushroom. You can see there, those are all from the same mushroom. Um, it's dependent upon the mordants. That's what they call the additional chemicals that are being combined with the mushroom. And then the color ranges from yellow to orange to green to black. You can see them there. And it looks like wool that's been dyed. There you go. These are some examples that were, I think, being sold online. I took a look and, and found some pictures. I've never actually done this myself. I'd like to someday, maybe. The next one we're going to look at is the shaggy bracket. This is Inonotus. Hispidus. I think I said that right. Hispidus. <laughs> it's hard to know exactly how a Latin word should sound uh, since I don't actually speak Latin. Uh, so the bracket is reddish yellow becoming rusty brown and developing these concentric bands with uh, a very red uh, margin. You can see that there. It's almost like someone put lipstick on it. Uh, it's fan-shaped, sometimes eccentric in its shape. Uh, you can see there it, it, it has a very upraised um, upraised basal area there. Uh, these are velvety to the touch and they seem to have an uneven surface. You can see that clearly in the photo too. It's quite rough. Uh, the margin is round when young and then becomes flat and wrinkled with age. So this would be a younger one based upon that because you can see how round that margin is almost like a bumper. And then these grow up to about 10 inches in diameter. So once again, a fairly large mushroom. There is a photo from the side. Again, you see that rounded bumper-like margin. Here's a size reference. Looks like we're looking at the bottoms of these one. Again, that would be a very small version. I don't even know why I chose that for a size reference because clearly these grow significantly larger than that. Uh, the pores are off-white, turning brown with age, and then this produces a white spore print. In terms of the ecology, these are parasitic to saprobic. They grow directly upon dead to dying hardwoods with a preference for ash and apple trees. So we do have some ash in the province. Um, that's what you'll find them on. and. Uh, apple trees maybe in somebody's yard I don't know I don't think those are native here uh, these are solitary to scattered and they are found summer through fall very similar dyes uh, from what we saw on the previous mushroom a little bit darker looks like in the green color ranges from yellow to orange to green and again it's dependent upon which mordant you use alongside the mushroom yeah, again, some nice, nice uh, shades there. Here's here's some examples again of yarn or wool made from this. The next mushroom we will look at. We have covered this mushroom, if you recall, in the uh, toxic toadstools of Saskatchewan or the malevolent mushroom, somewhere along those lines. This is actually quite a toxic mushroom. Uh, this is the cinnamon bracket. Papillopilus nigillans. So, um, again, uh, reddish orange to cinnamon in color with concentric bands, fan shaped, 
short stipe with a lateral attachment that means it's attached to the wood from the side or with a sessile attachment so no attachment at all um, the margin is cream to pale yellow and young smooth or wavy it's again velvety becoming bald that's kind of what we've been seeing with a lot of these uh, polypores used for dyeing uh, has a rough and uneven surface this is a very small mushroom uh, in retrospect uh, well compared to the other ones it's uh, up to maybe three inches in diameter again tan to brown with a dark orange margin large pores are angular it produces a white spore print so if you recall adding any sort of acid to this mushroom even on its surface will turn it violet a very uh, nice violet so uh, using an acidic mordant um, these are what you can get from this mushroom uh, very beautiful natural violet dye and that's why I include it again because that's that's um, as important to mushroom picking as knowing not to put it in your mouth there it goes again one of my favorite colors now this next one here uh, the surprise web cap uh, this is Cortinarius semi-sanguinensis I came very close to including this as well in the toxic mushrooms but I figured the overall talk about how toxic uh, web caps are in general would, would suffice um, it doesn't really look like any of the uh, any of the edible mushrooms that we pick so I just let that be plus I figured it was more important to include here because again this is an important mushroom found um, pretty much throughout the world uh, used for dyeing the cap is yellow to tan to reddish brown and darkest in the center it is convex flattening out and becoming umbilicate you can very clearly see that there it is a very exaggerated umbilicate it's got that very uh, exaggerated umbo there and then kind of flattening out um, the margin becomes wavy with age and then it's up to about three inches in diameter and then yeah it's smooth or it has a very fine scaling you can actually see the scaling fairly well there uh, here is a size reference for you and there surprise look at that lovely gills ketchup red becoming rusty brown with age that rusty brown is from the spores if you recall our web cap uh, presentation you'll remember that uh, Cortinaria species produce rusty uh, reddish brown spores in a very large deposit so you'll usually see a ring around the stipe as to where they they occurred uh, these are adnate gills so they reach across and just touch the stipe uh, they are close together uh, there are fairly frequent um, yeah I'd say frequent uh, short gills between those gills didn't didn't mention that there this is also going to be protected by a cortina that gives the genus its name a cortina looks like spider webs as opposed to a partial veil so when it's young it'll have those wispy fragments uh, on the edges of the uh, margin of the cap and again left over on the the uh, stipe and uh, yeah that rusty brown spore print that I've already mentioned very beautiful contrast of colors there this is a quite an exquisite looking mushroom the stipe is yellow becoming rusty brown towards the base and you can see that there if you look at the base of the stipe uh, it is cylindrical for the most part to clavate so clavate is where it has a gradual sort of uh, taper towards the upper apex right the base is thick and then the, the apex is thin and there's a taper between the two uh, cylindrical is just the same width throughout it has a central attachment to the cap uh, it has a rusty brown ring zone that may have cortina fibers though I don't actually see that there um, this must be a fairly new mushroom and then these grow up to about four inches high so these are mycorrhizal with pine you will find them in areas with jack pine and then down in the uh, southwest corner of the province where there may be uh, some lodgepole 
pine kicking around. Uh, they are preferential to mossy habitats. You can see that very well here. Um, generally speaking, when a mushroom is preferential to a mossy habitat, that's where you'll find it. Uh, these are also terrestrial. They are found scattered to gregarious, so you can find them in large quantities. And they are found summer through fall. And I like those cute little lumbos there. They're nice and yellow. So this is what you make with this mushroom. Very, very striking uh, crimson red uh, or a black. So you can do various shades of red, orange, purple, and black. I don't see any purple there, but I'm sure it must exist. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it. Uh, and then, of course, again, the dye color is dependent upon the mordant used. And you can see they've listed down the mordants that they've combined those with there in this sample. There you go. There's the purples on the whole shades. And that's kind of a, a really almost purplish black, really unique. I really like the orange. And uh, the, the crimsons that we saw prior uh, were, were very, very striking too. Yeah, very, very much sought after mushroom for this purpose. Again, surprise webcap, look at those pinks. So, I mean, for just finding uh, a fungus on the ground that you can then turn into a dye that produces that in a fabric, that's, that's, that's really nice. This next mushroom we've also uh, looked at in the, uh, if you recall, the tooth mushroom section. This is actually an edible mushroom uh, that um, I quite enjoy. This is the turtle hedgehog. This is Sarcodon squamosus. So the cap ranges from brown to tan in coloration. It is convex, flattening quickly, sometimes developing a slight central depression. You can see it, it how the big scales in the center there are kind of almost angling down there's almost like a depression starting there uh, often eccentric in shape oval or wing shaped uh, and the cuticle is zone 8 with coarse dry raised scales you can see that there as well uh, the margin is downturned and kind of smooth or wavy depending upon how old it is uh, it flattens out eventually and this can be quite a large mushroom they can grow up to about 12 inches in diameter especially when they're wing shaped or eccentric this one's more eccentric, kind of like an oval. Uh, the teeth are gray to tan in coloration. They're quite brittle. So if you run your fingers along them, especially in older ones, they will break off. Um, I could almost equate them to uh, softer pine needles. Uh, not sharp at all, but they'll, they'll break off and kind of make that... It, it's just what it reminds me of. You can actually see spots here where, where they've been broken off. Uh, they are adnate to slightly decurrent. Um, I find that when they are, do become decurrent, the teeth become very, very tiny when they start running down that stipe. And then this produces a brown spore print. Uh, the stipe is gray in coloration. It is solid and thick. It is cylindrical. Attachment is either central or off-center and eccentric. And the stipe is, is quite short. It's up to about three inches high and about an inch and a half thick. These are mycorrhizal with pine and rarely hardwoods. So look for this around jack pine areas and mixed forest. Um, if you're around spruce and you find this, you have the wrong mushroom. You have the uh, hawkswing. Uh, this mushroom is found summer through fall. These grow solitary or in scattered groups, sometimes even in arcs or rings. Uh, and these are terrestrial mushrooms. Now here is the nice uh nicest part of this maybe even more so than the taste is this beautiful sort of uh what what would you call that turquoise i guess uh it's dependent upon the the mordant used so it creates various shades of blue and green and yet yeah, turquoise that i put there there you go there's some more shades of of a uh, dyed fabric or dyed wool. This next fungus is one that I've found several times. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite funguses. 
to just find. I've never used it for this purpose, but this is the Bluetooth fungus, Hydnellum ceruleum, and it's a very interesting looking fungus. Uh, it looks completely different from the top than from the side. So the fruiting body is off-white to yellowish brown with a blue hue. It has a variable shape ranging from lobed, fan-shaped, to shelves, to rosette-shaped, to vase-shaped, to pillar-shaped, to just completely off-the-wall eccentric. So it can look like pretty much anything. Um, it is velvety, uh, sometimes with pits or an uneven surface. You can see the pits there in this one. These would be more of a shelf-shaped uh, specimen here that we're looking at. Uh, they're deep blue, uh, the margin is wavy, and it exudes a thick red liquid. We'll see that here momentarily. And this grows up to about six inches across. They're usually smaller. I've only ever found them at about three inches. So there we go. On the left, we see something that's now vase shaped or cup shaped. It's still got those nice wavy margins. And then on the right, you can see this really pillar eccentric shape that it's got going on. And what you're actually seeing there too, uh, on the one with the red liquid that's coming out of it, you're seeing the teeth up, up along the side. Those would be underneath the shelf uh, formation on the left. Uh, so this is again, another toothed mushroom, not a toxic mushroom, but not one that you wanna eat. It's a very bitter, very, very spicy. Um, but uh, it is not poisonous, regardless of that, though it might make you puke just from the taste, supposedly. That's what I've heard. So here's a size reference for you. I love that photo of the uh, ferns growing out of the top there or whatever that is. Uh, but uh, yeah, very, very unique mushroom to find and photograph. And if you want to make a dye out of it, the teeth are blue, becoming gray, then brown with age. Uh, they are decurrent, and regardless of whatever shape this mushroom takes, and this produces a brown spore print. And there's a close-up again of the teeth on a shelf-like version hanging down. These are mycorrhizal with conifers and oak. So uh, I have found them up around the Emma Lake area where they seem to grow um, in plentitude around uh, spruce. Uh, these are terrestrial mushrooms. They are scattered to gregarious uh, and several individuals often will fuse together and that's what forms those like weird shelf um, formations and stuff like that. And then these are found summer through fall. Various dyes are derived from the mushroom. Uh, the dye color again, that's dependent upon the mordant use. So we'd be looking at uh, blue, green, and turquoise. And you can see a, a good spread of color there. Now this next one, I believe this is the last one, this is probably the most bizarre mushroom that you will ever encounter. Uh, it's called the Devil's Tooth. This is Hydnellum pecky. So the fruiting body is off-white to pale pink turning brown with age. So when they're old, they don't look so interesting. They just look bleh. Uh, it has, a, again, a variable shape. This is the same genus as the last mushroom we saw. So it's gonna go through the ranges of uh, lobed, fan-shaped, shelves, rosette shape, uh, vase, cup-shaped, uh, pillar-shaped, just off-the-wall eccentric, like this that we're looking at right now. Uh, I guess that's kind of like a bunch of pillar-shaped mushrooms fused together. Uh, it's got a velvety surface, sometimes with pits or an uneven surface. Wavy margin. You can see that it's got a very like rough uh, kind of almost scalloped margin even. Um, very eccentric. And then it's exuding a thick red liquid. These, grows up, th these can grow up to about six inches across, but usually slightly smaller. There's some more examples for you of just how strange this mushroom, this is this is an example of a mushroom where you can't mistake it for anything else, despite being incredibly varied in how it can appear. There's a size reference for you. There's a gooey liquid. 
Uh, the teeth are pale pink, tanning with age. They are decurrent, running down whatever serves as a stipe. And then uh, again, it produces a brown spore print. Yeah, there's uh, a slightly older one it's starting to brown out. Uh, these are mycorrhizal with pine. So you'll find them around jack pine and again in the southwest portion of the province. They are terrestrial, they are scattered to gregarious with several individuals again often fusing together. And you see one thing about this that I don't have listed here, but often they'll fuse at places that aren't the base. Often when mushrooms fuse together it's at the base, um, but these will fuse together sometimes at the top and such like. Uh, and then these are found summer through fall. So again, you would expect that to be red or pink. Again, it's gonna be various shades of green turquoise. This one extends into black. And uh, here, if you want to uh, copy that down, this is a list of other potential dyes. And I didn't put the list here because there's lots and lots and lots of them. Many of those mushrooms either aren't found here or are mushrooms that we've actually already colored like a bunch of the uh, agaricus mushrooms, for instance, I believe can be used. Uh, certainly anything in the inky cap area can be used to make that. Uh, inky caps, by the way, can also be used to make a, a nice natural ink if you like to do ink drawings. Um, yeah, so feel free to experiment. I'm, I'm surprised that there aren't more people in this kind of niche hobby in Saskatchewan. I know that there were specialized groups just for doing this in other provinces, but I uh, couldn't really find anything about Saskatchewan, which is weird because we have a lot of the really popular mushrooms for dyeing found here. Uh, so yeah, well, I hope you enjoyed this. I think this might be the last video I do until the fall uh, because I would rather be picking mushrooms and making videos and I'm kind of uh, running short on ideas. So this is the Mushroom Wizard. I imagine I'll make more videos and talk to you again next, uh, starting next winter sometime.